one of the best longevity supplements out there is now even better. Eight times better, if you can believe it. Before we begin, I need to take care of some business. I just wanted to let you guys know that I now offer personal one-on-one -on -one longevity coaching. If you're interested in the idea of longevity, but the amount of information out there and the complexity of it is kind of scaring you away, don't worry, I got your back. I just introduced a 12-week program in conjunction with a longevity guide, my online course. You'll get 13 coaching sessions with me and access to me through Telegram to ask questions that won't wait for the next session. If there are any resources that you need to help you along the way with your longevity journey, like a checklist or something, I'll create a custom resource just for you. And of course, you also get access to the longevity guide. Now, if this sounds like something you might be interested in and you'd like to learn more, just click on the link right up here. It'll also appear again at the end of the video and it's also in the description below. Okay, in today's video, we're going to be wrapping up the series of interviews that I did with Lucas Owen, the YouTuber from Melbourne, Australia, who has the Boost Your Biology channel. In this interview, the last in the series, we'll be talking about creatine, one of the most studied supplements on the market and one that has very specific and well-documented benefits. And we'll be talking about a new form of creatine. Welcome back, Lucas. It's great to have you back on the channel uh, again. Uh, we've had some great information from you in the past, and I'm really looking forward to the topic for today's uh, uh, conversation, which is going to be about creatine. Yeah, I'm, I'm stoked to be here, Lance, again. And um, we're talking about a, a topic that I think is going to be very relevant to pretty much all of your audience and that is you know creatine and how we can leverage the power of this new form of creatine right right so before we jump into that let's just can we touch a little bit on on the original form of, of creatine creatine monohydrate i know that it's the, I'm, i've always been a big user of, of creatine myself i know that it's uh it seems to help my um my athletic performance uh it seems to help with uh hypertrophy and it also, uh, I know, is a is a pretty good nootropic. Yeah, for sure. I mean, creatine monohydrate is definitely considered the gold standard form of creatine. There's many different creatines that have tried to enter the marketplace, um, but none of them have proven to be effective or as effective as creatine monohydrate. So creatine monohydrate, most of the research was conducted on athletic performance but we're seeing new research coming out now talking about the benefits of creatine monohydrate to combat cognitive decline, to assist with general brain function, um, and to assist with other parameters. So definitely creatine monohydrate, even as little dosages as around you know, one to two grams per day, can yield a very favorable effect on our biology. Right. Yeah. So, um, but what... I get the impression that you think there's something wrong with uh, with creatine monohydrate. What what would that be? Well, if we look at creatine monohydrate, whilst I said it's you know the gold standard creatine, there's actually a precursor of creatine that was originally studied in the 1970s, and that's something called GAA or guanidinoacetic acid. Now, GAA is the precursor of creatine. And, you know, we've spoken about berberine before and the metabolite dihydroberberine being more effective. GAA, when combined with creatine, gives us something known as cregatine. And this cregatine appears to outperform creatine monohydrate itself, you know, significantly. And so this is the new form of creatine that I think is going to be extremely popular in the next three to five years. Okay, so uh, I've watched some of your videos on on creatine, and um, you you mentioned in those videos that creatine monohydrate is not very stable; that it tends to break down uh, before we can actually um, like break down in the can, so that when we actually are consuming it, it might not be nearly as effective as it was when it was first created. Is that or exactly first produced? exactly correct, there, Lance? I mean, if we look at the um the problem with creatine monohydrate, if it's not stored correctly and if the, the packet is slightly open, for example, because creatine is hygroscopic, it actually, the, the moisture can actually degrade 
your creatine monohydrate if it's not stored correctly. So a lot of people who say that they're non-responders to creatine monohydrate might actually just be consuming poor quality or like poorly stored creatine. Okay. All right. So, um, so what is, what is this new form? How do they, how is it produced? How is it created? So what they did was they looked at that precursor GAA, guanidinoacetic acid, which is the, mm-hmm. the, you know, the precursor material for creatine synthesis in the human body. Then they combined it with creatine itself and they, you know, merged both together. And now we've got a super creatine, um, which outperforms creatine monohydrate in a number of ways. The first one is that this particular form of creatine actually utilizes three additional pathways in order to enter the cell. So creatine monohydrate uses only one pathway. This okay. way, this form uses three additional pathways, which is number one, the GABA receptors, number okay. two, the taurine receptors, and even number three, the via passive diffusion. Um, so this is one of the ways in which this creatine actually outperforms creatine monohydrate. So which pathway does creatine monohydrate use? It uses the creatine transporter one, which is the most well studied oh. pathway. Yep. Right. So are you saying then that, that this new form of creatine doesn't use that pathway at all? It does use that pathway, but it actually has an ability to enter the cell through three other additional okay. backdoor pathways. So in all so in total then there's four different pathways that this new form of creatine uses. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. And that's what makes it unique as far as its um, ability to saturate, you know, the cell. And, Mm -hmm. you know, you've seen, you know, a bunch of um, creatine monohydrate protocols, which is like the typical, you know, you see online, they say like 10 to 10 to 15 grams is a loading dose. And then five grams is like a maintenance. Um, Yeah. Yep. That's because of that, you know, saturation pathway. Okay. All right. So this new form of creatine is it is it is it as susceptible as creatine monohydrate to uh, breaking down in air? Well, the unique part about this particular creatine is that it's actually um, it's impossible to even buy it in a in a bulk sachet at the moment. It's actually the manufacturer in Serbia and they actually manufacture it in a sachet format. And so this sachet format is really, um, you know, it makes it impossible for air to get through or water to seep through. And so the packaging makes it effortless and, you know, keeps the creatine highly stable. Okay. So then what you're saying is, is that the manufacturer, it's, it's kind of like a, uh, you see like one use per sachet. Yeah, exactly. And so if we look at, um, the actual comparison, with creatine monohydrate versus this creatine, over four weeks of consumption, regular creatine monohydrate only saturates muscle tissue by an increase of around 2%, whilst this creatine format actually increases muscle creatine content by 16.9%, um, which is a, a relative rise of around eight times right. more effective than cre- uh, creatine monohydrate. Wow. Okay. All right. So yeah, that's, that's pretty significant. Yeah. Yeah. So, and even, um, go ahead. I was going to say, even in the brain as well, we've seen, as I mentioned with the um, saturation ability, uh, creatine actually provides 3.9 times more creatine in the gray matter and 1.9 times more creatine in the white matter of the brain as compared to creatine monohydrate. Because that GAA uh, portion actually helps to penetrate the blood-brain barrier. Right, right. Okay. So what about price-wise? How does it compare to creatine monohydrate? I know that creatine monohydrate is pretty darn inexpensive. Is, it was, is, would you say the same is true for uh, the, uh, the, the new form? Yeah, so creatine monohydrate is definitely one of the cheaper supplements, just like with many other amino acids like glycine and taurine. Um, it's, it's very cheap, but the um, if we look at the cost comparison to creatine, this creatine form is more expensive. Like it's sure. not, it's not cheaper than creatine monohydrate, but it's 
tends to be more suited towards people who have either used creatine monohydrate and have not noticed any benefit. Okay. So there's a big percentage of the population that when they say they use creatine monohydrate, they say they, they're, they're a non-responder. So they don't right. notice the effect. This could be a form that could be useful for those individuals who complain about being a non-responder. Okay. So I'm, I'm guessing that, you know, most of the people who use creatine are probably uh, younger men who are, are athletes of some kind or bodybuilders or, you know, uh, involved in sports, uh, who work out on a regular basis. How is this applicable to uh, older men who are trying to maintain their muscle mass, who you know are trying to you know stave off sarcopenia? Um, yeah, so I think uh, this could be a complementary therapy amongst you know weight training or weight bearing activity to minimize the impact of sarcopenia, which is a, a loss of muscle function and, and muscle size as we age. So I think, um, you know, utilizing things that will have an anabolic effect, so a somewhat anabolic effect, so increasing protein intake, obviously to around 1.6 grams to 2.2 grams per kilogram of body weight is usually, right. a, you know, an ideal target. And then complementing that with like, you know, some of these anabolic agents such as you know, cregatine and even minimizing the impact of cortisol, which we can do with, you know, taurine, magnesium, glycine, and other amino acids. Right. So given that it is it is anabolic, what impact does it have on like mTOR and that pathway? Yeah. So there is some research indicating that creatine itself does appear to have a favorable effect on mTOR signaling. So we're oh, going to be right. seeing that effect on just with creatine monohydrate. There is some research outlining the impact of creatine monohydrate on that um, mTOR pathway and even activating satellite cells um, in skeletal muscle tissue as well. So if it has a, a, a beneficial impact on mTOR, would it then also have a beneficial impact on AMPK? Um, so there's obviously like, you know, the the, the balance between AMPK right. activation and mTOR stimulation. So um, usually what we see with some of these compounds is ones like berberine and dihydroberberine and, and metformin, you know, they're pro-AMPK, so they stimulate AMPK, whereas the creatine and the protein, some of the other amino acids, methionine, these are more of the mTOR stimulators and um, activators. Oh, okay. So when you said it had a, 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 a positive effect on the mTOR, you meant in terms of anabolically rather than uh, the, yeah, you know, exactly. more of a longevity. So from a longevity point of view, it's it's a little bit detrimental. If uh, if, well, if, <laughs> if 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 mTOR if stimulating the mTOR pathway is considered detrimental to longevity, then. Uh, it sounds like creatine kind of goes along that same. It's uh, it's plausible, yeah, to 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 assume that. Um, okay. It, yeah, there's obviously there's other ways to counteract that with like drugs like rapamycin and things like that. Right. But um, yeah, definitely interesting. So would you would you suggest then maybe cycling uh, creatine if because what I'm looking at is kind of like there's a bunch of supplements and, and nutraceuticals and whatnot that are, you know, kind of pro-AMPK, -A pro-autophagy, that kind of stuff, uh, while others are more anabolic, pro-mTOR. And I'm looking at cycling them so that I'm, you know, when I'm, um, you know, taking rapamycin and, and, and you know, maybe spermidine and something like that and trying to get the AMPK, AMPK uh, boosted and and get autophagy boosted as opposed to when I'm doing the other doing more anabolic stuff so would you would you cycle uh, creatine like that or would you take it pretty consistently all the time yeah yeah if we're looking at like a longevity aspect that's a great point you mentioned there like um, rotating it with autophagy inducers like spermidine like fisetin, um and things like that. I'd combine the creatine the creatine protocol we would put in similar to like an NMN or an NAD boosting protocol. So sort of aligning it with that um, right. since they're both great for like reproduction. I mean, the most profound benefit we're getting with 
increasing creatine saturation is the the bump and the increase in ATP production, which is the body's primary energy currency. Right. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So what's what what what's the dosage? What, what dosage would you recommend? Um, yeah. So with uh, with the creatine, as with what we've seen with, I mean, creatine monohydrate typically is around five grams per day for creatine monohydrate. For this version of creatine, um, we're looking at just one sachet per day, which is about one point eight grams. Um, okay. So it's actually a lower dosage compared to creatine monohydrate. Okay, and that that one point eight grams is pretty consistent across all people regardless of, of, of how how big or small they are what their weight is yeah typically a special thanks to lucas for all this great information and don't forget check out my 12-week longevity coaching program and that's it for me i'm out of here catch you next week